I don't like to spoil Raw before we do get into it segment by segment, but I do need to say this. If around about 24 hours ago when Clash of Champions came to an end, you sat there on your sofa and you went, I know what's going to happen. Kane is going to return to the WWE and he's going to beat up a load of the top guys that are currently on the roster. You would have been one of two people, a liar, you are a liar, you're a very bad person, you make babies cry, or two, you would have been Vince McMahon. But I even debate that one, because I can envision a world where on Monday morning, Vince McMahon went, hey Glenn, hey pal, we're gonna be in your town while you're the governor. You wanna be on Raw? And he was like, yeah. Not how Kane talks. But anyway, look, this was one of the craziest episodes of Raw I think I've seen in 2019. So let's take the fop, the finger of power, give the good bits an up, give the bad bits a down, and see where we get at the end of it. Regret doing that. I'm a bit hyped up. I don't drink coffee. I had some this morning. Just felt tired. Let's do it. I don't usually do this when we kick things off. I like to try and be a positive Pete, as you know, but it just really irked me. Seth Rollins was here to kick off Monday Night Raw and cut one of those magic promos. And one of the first things Michael Cole says was, here he is, the Monster Slayer. I mean, what a pile of crap that is. I get it, he was the Beast Slayer. Now he's beat Braun Strowman. He's the Monster Slayer, but where does it end? Is he gonna be the Demon Slayer? If he beats Finn Balor, is he gonna be the Big Dog Slayer? If he ever meets Roman Reigns, is he gonna be the Fiend Slayer? If WWE screws up and has Bray Wyatt lose? A hell in a cell? I mean, what do we do? What do we do down? Anyway, from here, it was your usual stuff as Seth talked about everything that had gone down in the last 48 hours, including beating Braun Strowman at the pay-per-view. I just wanna throw it out there. We've gotta call a spade a spade. If I had a spade, I'd be holding it right now. When he did mention that, the crowd started to boo. And then when he mentioned that after the fact Bray Wyatt beat him up, the crowd started to cheer. Anyone else think that maybe The Fiend is about to swoop in and steal all of Rollins' momentum and all of his gold? Me too. Yowie wowie. Up. It is going to be these two in the cell at Hell in a Cell. And then wonderfully, Wyatt interrupted Seth using the Firefly Funhouse. And what a great, interesting, original way to build a feud. He even had some of the puppets running around him. He was telling the puppets to shut up. Seth just looked on like, what the hell is going on in my life? How did I get here? Wyatt then turned really creepy as he's wont to do and reminded Seth of all the mistakes that he's made and that the fiend never ever forgets. He then laughed, stared at Rollins and said he'd see him in hell. It was excellent and fair play to Seth who did his best job to try and sell this like he was a bit freaked out. And going forward, if you are going to feud with the fiend, please act scared. I don't want any of this are. Oh, I'm a big tough guy and I don't care about this. You gotta do it. Remember when Triple H acted like he'd seen a ghost when Mick Foley transformed into Cactus Jack? We need that every single day of the damn week. The best thing in the history of Raw then happened because as the Firefly Fun music played, we cut to all our match graphics that were gonna tell us what was going down later on the show and they're all upside down. Now I would presume the WWE did this to make it out like Wyatt's got magic powers and he's screwing with the production truck but it was just really funny. I don't know why it looked like this. It's just, it's a strange sight, right? You think something's gone wrong, and at no point did the commentators really let us know that it could be Bray. I mean, Renee Young did a little bit, but it wasn't enough, and I just sat there chuckling away. However, WWE then reminded us, flub tag team wrestling, who needs that ship? Give it a down. Braun Strowman had been seen running around backstage saying, whoever goes to the ring next, is gonna get these hands. And I presume one day he's gonna rip his hands off and give it to someone as a present. But unfortunately for both the Raw and SmackDown tag team champions, that being Bobby Roode, Dolph Ziggler, and The Revival, they were out for some kind of tag team summit. And I've no idea what that means, but you've already figured out. Out came Braun, he beat all these four guys up to remind you, never, ever, 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 ever take tag team seriously. They're just pants. And honestly too, this just makes me hate Braun. I mean, it's not his fault. But if WWE felt the need to beat him at Clash of Champions and then come up with an idea to make him all strong again, just don't beat him at Clash of Champions. You took four guys that actually had some pizzazz and yeah, threw it in the toilet. And I told you on Sunday, only one thing goes in the toilet. Crap. Alexa Bliss and Nikki Cross were then saying they are going to beat Sasha Banks and Bayley in a tag team match later because that is on the cards. They also referred to Sasha Banks as a Smurf. That made me laugh and much like I said seven days ago, never forget that your women's tag team champions 
are now faces for absolutely no reason. I am really confused and trying to keep up with what the deal is between the OC, the Viking Raiders and Cedric Alexander, because they did indeed have a six man tag team match here. And rather than give Cedric Alexander anything, like even a little bit of a straw to have a little sip of some magic water, whatever that would be, nobody talks like that. We just went, eh, who cares about Cedric Alexander? Let's beat his ass one more time. Down. But yeah, once again, Gallows Anderson and AJ just beat the hoo-ha out of Cedric before he took another loss after the phenomenal forearm. Now, we gave the Viking Raiders experience, whatever they're called something, afterwards, because Ivan or Eric, or whatever the hell they call, did a big dive on the top rope and took everybody out. But then in the ring, Cedric was like, oh, I'm going to be inspired by this. I'm motivated. I'm going to get one on the United States champion. And then he got stars clashed off the second rope. I do want to point out that right now, I actually think that AJ may be the MVP in WWE. I mean, you can just take him and put in any role and he will make it work, much like he did with Stone Cold Steve Austin recently. But here, I am focusing on Cedric Alexander, a guy who had a pretty good king of the ring, seemed like he was building up to something, and instead got taken out behind the back sheds and pff, got shot in the head. And I'm trying to figure out why? Moving on, I didn't even clock that we were in Knoxville, even though the commentators did tell me this, which is of course where Mayor Kane governs, and we managed to work him into proceeding. Boy, howdy did we. He was hanging out with our truth and Carmella, and very nicely offered to show them around the town. But Carmella was very suspicious about this, because obviously our truth is the 24-7 champion. Also, if I was going to be suspicious of anybody, it would be Kane, because he is somebody that once electrocuted a dude's testicles. Also, if you haven't seen this skit, go and watch it. Kane sounded just like Tommy Lee Jones, and it was really weird. It was then the King of the Ring tournament final, something that we'd all been looking forward to, and something that we were all intrigued about. Could Jad Cable pull off a massive upset and beat Baron Corbin? And look, the answer is no, but I actually think a lot of good could come out of this. I'm keeping my fingers crossed, and therefore, get it up. I loved how split people were about this as well, because I did a little poll on my Twitter. I wanted to get a gauge of what everybody was thinking, and it literally, after 6,000 votes, ended 50% Chad Gable and 50% Baron Corbin. Don't let this sum it up. As already mentioned, it was Baron that got the win after he reversed the Tornado DDT into the end of days. But look, here's what you need to take away from this. A heel winning the King of the Ring always adds a little bit of something extra to proceedings. And Baron Corbin is the type of guy that can wear the crown and the cape and somehow he gets away with it. If we had done that with Chad Gable, it would absolutely plant him in the floor and there'd be no coming back from it. So the key about all of this is just making sure you use them in the right way after the fact. So play up to the whole Baron thing, make sure he comes across like an idiot in a good way, but don't just drop Chad Gable. That's the main thing. People were behind him, especially when the match was reaching its climax. As long as he keeps getting pushed and as long as he keeps getting featured and as long as he's able to keep showing people what he can do, then all of this would have been worthwhile. And I do understand your frustrations. I get you wanted somebody brand new to win and come out the other side smelling of roses. Let's give WWE the benefit of the doubt, even though I'm, that makes me an idiot. I get it. Also, I bet if Vince McMahon could, he would have sent Braun Strowman out there to beat up the King of the Ring because it's a tournament. Because as we've heard throughout the years, apparently Vinnie Mac don't like tag teams and he don't like tournaments. Unbelievable. And then, as had been revealed earlier in the day on social media, Maria Kanellis was magically back on Raw and she was going to reveal the gender of her baby. As soon as they confirmed this on my television set, I started looking around for Vince Russo. I couldn't find him. The Street Profits were introducing all of this, which doubled down on my point. Please put them in matches as soon as we can. And honestly, Michael Cole referenced it at first like it was the most important thing to happen in the history of Raw. Anywho, it began with Maria telling us that it was gonna be a boy and we all cheered, we were all so excited, and then said to Mike, hey, you ain't the dad because the father is Ricochet. Ricochet looked at her like he'd just been slapped around the face. He was like, bro, I ain't nothing to do with that. But Mike Kness was too mad, he marched to the ring, he had a match with Ricochet, and Ricochet absolutely whipped his ass. This was all played as one big joke, but there's more. So give me a second, then we'll get back to it. And the reason for that is because all of a sudden we had another Firefly Funhouse two in one episode. Can you believe it? Giving it up. Bray was showing us his wall of friendship, which unsurprisingly had pictures of Finn Balor, Jerry Lawler, Mick Foley, and Kurt Angle. But they all had red crosses on their faces to indicate what Bray had done to them over the last few weeks. And at that point, Wyatt turned to the camera and he was like, maybe we need a new picture. 
maybe it should be Seth Rollins. Brilliant, isn't he? Yes, he is. Right, and this is where we did get back to our baby reveal. And this is also where somehow I'm giving it up. Because after Maria told Mike that Ricochet wasn't actually the baby daddy, she revealed who it was going to be. And everybody get down and close your eyes and look to the skies and say thank you. It was Rusev. Back looking leaner than ever and with a moustache that would make a tree cry, I completely understand what you're thinking. Why the hell would we bring Ruru back in a comedy angle? And I agree with you, and he's probably going to vanish from TV in a few weeks. But I was so excited to finally see him back on Raw. I don't even care. I made noises like a cow that was being milked. I want him back. I missed him so much. And you know what? In fact, to prove this, because words mean nothing without actions, I'm doing this. It's you and I, Rusev, it's you and I until the day that we die. You know what, no, this isn't, this ain't good enough. I'm going again. So my facial hair isn't as dark as I would appreciate, so you can't really see it. But Rusev, no, I have also fashioned this into a moustache, so we can now stand as one. Hashtag Rusev's moustache. Anyway, he then beat the absolute snoz out of Mike Kanellis and made him tap out to the accolade, and that's exactly what I want to see on Rusev Day. Now, yes, I would prefer it if he wasn't the championship picture, but he's not. And again, I'm just so happy to see him back. I'm going to take what I can get. We were then back to Truth Tour of Knoxville, and Carmelo was right. You absolutely can't trust Kane. He had a secret referee up his sleeve, and after Truth had run into the football post, Kane pinned him. One, two, three, and he is your new 24-7 champion. And think of that. Debuts at 1997 at Bad Blood rips the Hell in a Cell door off its hinges. 22 years later, he holds what many people believe to be a comedy belt. I love Glenn Jacobs. But we needed this kind of thing after the craziness we had just seen. Give it an up. And I would never give anything but an up to Rey Mysterio versus Cesaro. He's not that kind of a guy. Up. It started great as Cesaro told Rey Mysterio the next time he sees his son, he's just going to beat him up. And what a threat that is. Imagine you met anybody in your real world and you went, oh, hey friend or hey partner or hey work colleague or hey stranger. And they went, next time I see your son, I'm going to beat them up. You would be pretty mad as Rey Mysterio was here. He got all fired up, although Cesaro did basically take most of his match. But eventually he got 619 and he got kind of Canadian destroyed. It was like a modified version. Rey Mysterio wins. He continues his way back to the top, where I'm sure Dominic will turn on him and absolutely kick him in the face. I do think it is time for some parity, though. We can't just focus on one person when the same thing is happening elsewhere. So bring it down. Let's debut something new here on Ups and Downs. That's right. It's the Swiss Superman stock meter. And what we're going to do here is we have Cesaro stock because he loses all the time. And right now it's on zero and we will track his progress as we go forward. But the reason I have introduced this is because I believe we'll be 12 months down the line and it will still be on zero. Cesaro and Sami Zayn, two peas from the same pod. Don't get me wrong, I ain't happy about it. Just calling it out. We also saw another little clip from the Firefly Funhouse as Bray Wyatt was putting a picture of Seth Rollins up on the wall. And this was the first time I thought to myself, you know what, less is more, we didn't need to do this. It was a bit like in a movie, when the character explains the plot to you, even though you're already aware of the plot. Yes, I get it, Bray. I get it, WWE. The whole point of the wall of friendship is that when you beat somebody up, they'll go up there, and now you're feuding with Seth, he'll go up there too. Like, well, not like super bad, and I love Bray Wyatt. We could have just cut out. However, we then got official confirmation that we will be getting the draft in October. And when that does happen, the wild card rule is dead and we will have specific brands. I mean, they must have missed the fact that I gave it a funeral a few months ago, but whatever. And then on top of that, we also got a return package for the authors of Pain, the AOP. And it was like the realest, most cool, badass thing WWE has done in ages. They actually felt like a team that could come on Raw or SmackDown and just beat everybody up. It was good, so all of this gets it up. My word, did we then just go on some kind of roller coaster with the women? But hey, I guess it was never boring. Up. It started with Sasha Banks and Bailey taking on our WWE Women's Tag Team Champions. So, of course, because of that, Nikki Cross and Alexa Bliss lost. Why would they? So, given that Becky Lynch and Charlotte beat Bailey and Banks last week, from my deduction, we should now be getting Alexa Bliss and Nikki Cross versus Becky Lynch and Charlotte. But we're not going to get that because, as always, these championships are just used as, well, they're just plot devices. I know all titles are plot devices, but I still need to believe in them. And ever since they debuted in February, 
They just feel like an absolute joke. And for that reason, that gets a down. All this was soon forgotten though, because as soon as Nikki Cross had tapped out to the bank statement, we got down to what I believe the important part is, at least from WWE's point of view. Because Banks and Bailey got some chairs to do some more damage before Becky Lynch had seen enough, and she started storming out there and basically had like a lightsaber battle with the weapons against her new foe. Understanding that she was two against one, though Charlotte Flair then arrived, maybe to help Becky Lynch, or maybe just to beat up Bailey, given what happened at Clash of Champions, and she booted Bailey right in the face. And given she had heels on that were bigger than me, that must have damn hurt. That opened the door for Lynch to send Sasha Banks packing, which she did. And afterwards, I just had to lie down, especially because midway through the match, that happened now around about 76 years ago, we just got told on commentary that Alexa Bliss had to leave because she had a knee injury. I don't know if that's part of storyline or if it's real. And if it is real, all the best to Alexa Bliss. That would suck. And look, it is cool that all these storylines are overlapping, but again, it just feels like Nikki Cross and Alexa Bliss are becoming afterthoughts. And that's because, you know, they have these championships and anybody who gets these titles, it's like having an albatross across your neck. You're doomed. Banks then cut a promo saying she wants Lynch at Hell in a Cell, to which Lynch then cut another promo responding saying that's fine, but I don't want you at Hell in a Cell. I want you in Hell in a Cell. So if you are keeping count, that is two Cell matches we'll get in October. Bray versus Seth and Becky versus Sasha. Truth then won back the 24-7 title out of nowhere when he rolled up Kane, the most devastating surprise maneuver in all of the WWE. And then Glenn Jacobs teased he was going to go back to the demon version of his alter ego when he started to choke R-Truth. R-Truth managed to calm him down and remind him, look, if you're 24-7 champion, you ain't gonna be governor. And Glenn agreed with that. Then it transpired they'd actually headed to the arena. What could that mean? Lacey Evans then beat Dana Brooke. And I get it, I understand they were trying to put over the whole Lacey Evans versus Natalia feud because Lacey did win after the sharpshooter, but the crowd didn't care. And it was just so, like I say, out of nowhere, it kind of just passed me by like a tree in a pleasant breeze. Down. Talking of all this bizarre, this though, our main event for Raw was Bobby Roode versus Seth. Rollins. And once again, who the hell thought that was ever be a thing? It must have been Random Match Monday, but it was, I think, the first chance that Brood has been given to show what he can do on the main roster, and he absolutely kept up with the Universal Champion. In fact, I think he looked quite good. Also, he didn't even technically lose, because after he had been curb stomped, Dolph Ziggler was in the ring, and he'd been interfering the whole time anyway, and he started smashing on Seth, which of course caused the DQ. So let me just catch you all up as well, and I'll catch myself up too. At the start of the show, we can beat up all the tag team division with Braun Strowman, but our Universal Champion isn't even allowed to beat one of them. Take that for what it's worth. And because of that, put another down on the counter. Down. However, given all the effort, and I like seeing guys like Rude in the main event, you went up. The whole thing then became even more unglued because the OC were out here, and everybody was beating on Seth Rollins, and guess who made the save? That's right, Kane who now had his mask back on. What is going on? And to make it even more perplexing, and it ties into my earlier point about who is allowed to beat people up and who is not, Kane then started to beat up all the tag team division, and he started to beat up AJ Styles as well. I mean, this is Kane. Kane, the mayor of Knoxville. Thankfully, the whole thing was then saved, because as Kane went to do his pyro, the lights went out, an air of creepiness ran through the arena, and the fiend was behind him, and he put Kane down the government official with the mandible claw. And then he stared at Seth Rollins like he was going to eat his face. Make this man your champion, WWE. Push him to the moon, literally put him on the damn moon and don't take that belt off him till at least 2072. I mean, even the end of Raw was awesome because it was just the Firefly Funhouse logo with the music, but it was getting creepier and more scary as it went on because it was all disturbed and like, you know, getting in your ear like, oh, what the hell is going on? It was absolutely fantastic and of course, gets an up, and before you go, well, I didn't get a golden up. You gave a golden up yesterday on Classic Champions. One golden up a week, that counts. We do unfortunately have to finish how we started though, because during all of this, Michael Cole over and over and over again, at least three times, kept saying, it's the Fiend Bray Wyatt, it's the Fiend Bray Wyatt, it's the Fiend Bray Wyatt, just call him the Fiend. Call him the Fiend, you don't go, it's the Beast Brock Lesnar, or it's the Viper Randy Orton. Actually, you know what, you do sometimes, got to stop doing it. it just takes away from everything sometimes as well it's all right to be silent if this had ended up in silence that probably would have been better still so again not a big fan of this we've got to do it give it a down which brought raw to a close 
And I can't even tell you if it was good or bad, even though it's my job. But I will say this, it was never, ever dull. There must have been around about 722 segments from start to finish, and I have no idea how long this episode of Ups and Downs is going to be. But you have to forgive me, I've got to bring you all the content. I can't just skip bits. That would be ridiculous. So get my spinning arrow. I am going to give it an up just because, like I say, if I'm not bored and I got excited about doing this today, which I did, just got to go with it. But yeah absolutely nuts now don't forget to leave a comment below and let us know what you thought about last night's episode of raw like share and subscribe head over to whatculture.com and read yourself some articles follow what culture on twitter what culture wwe and watch more videos here on what culture wrestling my name is Simon from what culture and remember to get involved with the ups and downs trilogy for the week clash of champions yesterday raw right now and 2 p.m bst tomorrow we up those downs for smack down